Hello everyone, thank you so much for joining me again, Theo Gilbert, to look again in a practical way this time at the Micro Skills of Compassion in Online Group Work, part two. So we're going to be looking at some strategies that will help you develop yourselves as anthropologists, ethnographers, real people watchers for the management of your group in ways that you may not have thought about before. We're particularly interested in compassion being a sensitivity to a suffering and a commitment to alleviate that. But what does that mean in terms of group work? Compassion in group work then, in practical terms, is noticing, not normalizing your own or others distress or disadvantaging and doing something wise to reduce or prevent that. It may require doing something courageous. Compassion in the literature is very much associated now with courage. Lots of reasons for that. But your group work is looking for a flow of compassionate communication which could enhance the critical thinking processes of your group as a whole. That's what we're going to be looking at now. Back to group work meetings. If you remember, there are two recurrent features. Hundreds of students have told us that what they most worry about in their group work is the behavior of non-contributors, those who don't speak much or contribute uh, much to discussions, and monopolizers, those who will speak so much that other people don't get much chance to speak. But remember, we know from the threat system that we learned about in relation to the theory of compassion in part one, that these behaviours are nobody's, they are nobody's fault, nobody is to blame. And with that in mind, let's go on to what we can do. We'll start with non-contributors first. Golden rule, open the doors again for them, again and again and again. And I'm going to show you how you can do that. We're going to have a closer look at the non-contributing behaviours that we all, we all have these behaviours sometimes. There may be times when you're in a module when you have lots to say and others in a seminar in another module when you have very little. No one is to blame, but we must sort it out. The group work needs all, all people on board. The National Union of Students in 2010 reported too many students feeling left out of discussions and debate. So here immediately we get a sense that people may not be speaking, but it doesn't mean that they don't want to speak. What are we going to do about that? We're going to look at strategies for including others in terms of language, silences, the things we normalize, cliques, dominating pairs, the use of tone in your voice and using people's names, letting people stay out of the discussion, the power of thanking each other, checking your own and other's body language and working with non-readers who haven't prepared for the meeting. Language. Using local colloquial language with international students can cause them some real problems. It's a good idea to try and translate into the plainest language you can what you want to say. And that's very good practice for your academic writing where you should be doing that too, in order to be precise and clear. Check understanding with your international colleagues when you can as well. They appreciate it so much. Silences. Sometimes people feel they want to jump into silences. They feel awkward about silences and they, they want to fill them. Unfortunately, that can be a problem for those students who are a little shyer or who are international that would like to use those silences as an opportunity to come in and join the discussion. Don't worry about reasonable silences. It's just that the group's breathing and thinking. Everyone in the group needs a silence to think sometimes and digest what's been said. If you're listening carefully, you'll want to do that sometimes. Cutting others off in the middle of a sentence. We all do this sometimes, we don't mean to, but if we witness it being done, we need to do something about it. And it's worth knowing that it's often a monopolizer that will cut people off. They don't mean to, but we all do it sometimes. Monopolizing behavior can often originate from a clique or a pair within a group. The difficulty is that it excludes other people. 
And that's a problem because then it's up to each of us to think about how we can get the other students who are not included in. Here's some ideas. Invite other students in by name and tone. Angie, what did you want to say about that? Or uh, Tom, what you were saying the other day, remember, that was really interesting. Could you tell us more about that now? Or Mohammed, can you come back in with that point you made earlier? It was really interesting. So use your colleague's name to invite them to speak. Name and use a warm, warm tone of voice. And now I'd like you to close your eyes if you could for a moment just for a few moments for the next couple of slides and I'll tell you when to open them. These techniques of tone and name are helpful for your own self-compassion. A persistent inner self-critical voice can bully any of us sometimes, but it isn't you. It's only a thought. You are not your thoughts. Try to observe, notice any self-criticism, self-critical voice that you may have and how it makes you feel. We all have this sometimes. Try thanking it for trying to help you rather than fighting yourself over it. You've produced this critical voice. It's coming from your threat centre. No point in fighting it, but just tell it gently to go to sleep because you've got its message and now you want to, you need to think calmly and clearly. Next, speak to yourself inwardly with real kindness and choose a tone, a tone that you would use for someone in distress that you care deeply about. Use your own name too. You're not a machine. You're not a number. Practice this gently just for a minute, now and then every day until your brain gets used to this and begins to formulate coping mechanisms that you will need sometimes. And then if one day you become really stressed, you can combine this with deliberately slow, deep breathing, which I hope you're practicing now, to slow everything down. This can physiologically change your brain chemistry, your heart rate, for example, helping you think more clearly, more calmly. And next, Associate Professor of Human Development and Culture, Dr. Kristin Neff, with two minutes of more tips on how to be compassionate to yourself. First thing is just to give yourself permission to treat yourself kindly. A lot of people think that it's selfish or that it involves self-pity. It's really not. Remember, self-compassion recognizes the shared human condition. It's not, well, it was me, poor me. It's not life is difficult for everyone. So, um, and again, because it helps you give more to others, it's not selfish. So giving yourself permission to be kind, knowing that it's going to help you be happy, it's going to help others be happy. Then concrete things like noticing how you speak to yourself, asking, would I say this to a close friend? Hmm, usually not. What would I say to a close friend? Can I try treating myself that way? You can do this in letter writing. It's very effective. If you're, if you're really struggling, struggling, write yourself a letter in the same way that you would, again, what you would express to a good friend in the same situation, but write that to yourself. And then you can go back and read it. That's helpful. Um, probably one of the most helpful things, though, uh, because we're mammals, we are programmed evolutionarily to respond to warmth, physical warmth, soothing touch, and gentle vocalizations. When, as mammals, when we, uh, just like when the, think of a mommy lion and her, and her cub, we're, um, we're programmed for our bodies to calm down and to feel safe and to feel soothed. So one of the most effective ways to give yourself compassion is through some physical gesture because you're actually tapping into that mammalian caregiving system at a physiological level. So finding some touch that feels comfortable, um, a really common one might be to put both hands over your heart um, or maybe on your belly or cradle your cheeks or do something like this. Some people just holding their hand. Um, that can... Let your body know that you care. And then sometimes it's easier for your mind to follow after your body has calmed down a little bit. 
So let's return to the student who really is a little anxious to speak. What can we do? Well, when you invite other students in, just a simple wave from them will tell you they're not quite ready yet. But that's a signal for you to come back again and again to keep offering them the chances they need. Let's have a look now at something else that turns up from the threat system, freeze. The threat system, flight, fight or freeze. How does that turn up in a group? When someone freezes, and this can happen to any of us, their mind goes blank or they've no more to say. But they can pass the hot potato. That is a technique that you can use in your group, all of you. That is, they can quickly invite another student. So what do you think, Steve? Or to the group, what does everyone else think? Thanking each other makes a huge difference to the bonding that goes on within a group, especially when people are coming in to speak who have been nervous to do so. In relation to sensitivity to compassion, have a look at the responses. Really watch closely how members in your group thrive on inclusivity and thanks. While we're here, it's good to notice your own body language. It can be undermining in group meetings and even a small gesture like this can make a lot of difference to group dynamics. So although a lot of it is unconscious, we try to keep it conscious and to monitor it. Of course, the difficulty is that things can sometimes get really very frustrating. Nevertheless, let's see what we can do about those frustrating things as well. For example, the student who hasn't prepared for their online meeting. That means they haven't done any reading, they're not particularly present here, and the whole group is having to carry them. There may be many reasons for that, but one of the things that can really help that students have talked about in the past with group work in class is how two people in the group, not one, but two, can help that student with research skills they need or time management. It's usually research skills so that they can come forward next week with no difficulties if you're having regular group meetings on Zoom or Skype or whatever with something to feed the group. Coming back now to group work and the two recurrent features that turn up in teamwork or group work because of the threat system. And these features turn up in teams everywhere, not just in education, but in the workplace as well. And these tips I hope will be useful for you when you are in teams in that situation too in the future. So non-contributors, all these skills and strategies we've looked at are very useful for monopolizers to practice and to be a part of. But right now we're going to look at how to support monopolizers. Strategies for monopolizers and their groups. We can start with understanding what may be happening, being concise to leave spaces for others. Then we'll look at listening carefully to build on others' group ideas. And then the group's compassionate body language to help others be more concise and inclusive. And we're going to be looking particularly at this now as we go online. First, what you need to know about monopolizers. And indeed, this also applies to quieter students. Overlapping current cultures of competitive individualism everywhere in education, in business, in politics and media can overstimulate our species threat systems. The brain may respond by striving hard to avoid inferiority and over talking in teams is one such behavior. This is not the monopolizer's fault, but if the group lets it go, that means if it normalizes it and takes no compassionate action, it can undermine group achievement. It can undermine the group's critical thinking capacity. The first thing to do is try to avoid silencing the monopolizer. As the great psychotherapist Irvin Yalom said, you do not want to hear less. You want to hear more from the monopolizer. In other words, of substance. Let's just focus in for a moment and have a look at what might be happening in the monopolizer's world. I'm a monopolizer too, we all are sometimes. 
there may be a tendency to be so engaged and enthusiastic that you lose track of time. Be concise. Aim for 30 seconds if you can. If each contribution is 30 seconds, or we aim for that. That can really encourage the flow of communication around the group. The monopolizer also invite others to speak. Slow down and listen to others. If you do that, you can really build on what others say. And that is a great use of your cognitive skills. Many times I've seen students objecting to having to say less in groups, but then finding that they're listening and in interviews telling us that they have been able to really build on what the group has said and tutors also noticing that. So here you are online and there's a lot you can do to help the monopolizer. If the monopolizer pays attention to what he or she can see, watching the body language of those in the group. So for example, you can see the top three people on the right are signaling through their body language, many of these signals are non-verbal, that there are other people in the group who might like to speak as well. The gentleman at the end, the colleague at the end, is suggesting to the monopolizer that actually he could actually involve everybody else in the group. They're all here waiting as well to contribute. Thinking about the chat box now, colleagues can be putting in comments or questions as they go, and it's useful to point to the chat box when it's time for the monopolizer to pay attention to what's going on in the thought processes of the rest of the group. This is helpful. It's friendly and it's compassionate to the group because the group needs to think with all cylinders going, not just one. When disagreements arise, and they will, your compassionate skills now, the ones that we've learned so far, mean that even if half the group disagrees with the rest of the group, the group can still become more bonded, informed and insightful than before the disagreement. Can you see in the picture that this reaching into each other's thinking processes to explore these is so helpful to the group's critical achievement at the end? So welcome disagreement as an intellectual challenge. With compassionate skills, you will get through this and come out stronger. So purposefully explore each other's thinking processes with compassion. That means concisely and with collegial tone and body language as far as possible, and listen with patience and focus for others' rationales. Let's look now at some of the feedback that has been given by students who have used these compassionate skills when, for example, they were being assessed on research skills, critical thinking, and compassionate group work management. These are two students from the business school. The first one, we were sort of analyzing. I know I was, I was like watching each other. What's the body language like? That's a critical part of compassion to notice, to notice, and it's a cognitive skill. And the next student, student 29, I felt not as one person, but I felt as a person within an entity and the entity was my group. Like we're all focused on it. That suggests a shared identity, one of solidarity, one of feeling safe. And this was from a shy student about his actual assessment. And then below that study in the School of Computer Science, on their piece of work, I would listen to how they achieved this, how valued their input is. I also made sure I was sharing gratitude. During discussions, I always made sure to leave spaces for other people, says student 100. And what about the mature students? What about them? I was worried being the oldest person and the only native English speaker says student 110. Having 10 years of experience, working experience with people from different cultures and backgrounds, I never found it as smooth as this time. Outside of this university, we're still, outside of university, we're still hanging out together. In other words, what these students seem to have done is be able to achieve a negotiation around how they use the space with each other. This flow of compassionate communication.
is how the group gets smarter and smarter and more and more inclusive and bonded. And, and here's a summary of them. Strategies for addressing lack of contribution in the group. Do you remember the earlier slide, the yellow slide on this? And I've combined here onto this slide the strategies for addressing monopolizing behaviors in the group too. If all in the group keep the doors open for each other like this, members can feel safe together to explore multiple perspectives that enrich the quality of the group's critical thinking. And as a student here in yet another study in humanities said once, who was a really good talker and liked to talk and thought if people don't want to talk, well, that's up to them, who said later after she'd been taught and was using these compassion skills, you realize, she said, you're responsible. We're responsible for making sure other people have things to say and want to talk. So because of your compassionate skills, the quiet students can get themselves in. Because of your compassionate skills, the monopolizers can get themselves out. Thank you so much for joining me and good luck. Good luck and enjoy your group work. Take care.